So hi there, good afternoon and welcome to this talk which is the Animate button, mocap automation techniques at Ubisoft Montreal. Who am I? Uh, I'm Dan Lowe, I'm a senior technical animator at Ubisoft Montreal. Uh, I worked on a bunch of games as you can see here. Uh, I know different companies have different definitions for what a technical animator is. Uh, basically I come from an animation background uh, and most of my days spent animating just like any other animator but I also do a lot of technical things on the side like you know sort of building state graphs and designing animation tools working on the pipeline and also sort of making sure that all of our animators are using the technology the way that they should be doing and right now I'm working with Ubisoft's technology group on automation tools for animators and that's what I'm going to talk uh, to you about today before I start I want to give credit to this guy this is Zach Hall, he's one of our animation TDs at Ubisoft, and everything that I'm going to talk about today is stuff that I worked on together with Zach. So why the animate button? Uh, if you're not familiar with this, here's this kind of short video that I found on the internet. So yeah, it's this common joke that I think most animators know where it's kind of like, hey, we animate on computers, so we should just push the animate button and let the computer do everything. And of course, this is kind of ridiculous. We sort of know what really goes into it. But the premise of this talk, if there is a premise, uh, is to look at this question, with mocap at least, why not? We've already made a lot of our creative decisions at the, on the mocap stage, so why can't the computer do at least sort of some of these tasks for us? So. I'm going to save you the suspense and, and tell you that we have totally built what is essentially an animate button. Uh, we've got a tool that will take raw mocap data and with a few basic inputs will automatically process that into shippable game animations. This is it, it's called the automator. And if you look very carefully uh, in the top corner, maybe you can see that blue button says animate on it. Uh, this is just kind of a tease for now, I'm going to be demoing this tool at the end of the talk. But before that I'm going to talk about how we got here. So the talk split into three different parts. First, automating mocap cleanup is much more difficult when you've got bad mocap data to start with. So I'm going to cover some quick Ubisoft tips about how we get high quality mocap data. Second, I'm going to talk about a new technique that we came up with which we're calling adjustment blending. And that's really kind of at the core of what makes all of the automation stuff uh, possible. And then last, I'm going to talk about the automator tool, which is what I just showed, uh, which is where everything kind of comes together. So first, let's talk about mocap. So these bars here are kind of meant to represent the quality level of our mocap data as it goes through a typical pipeline. And usually with mocap, you tend to kind of lose a little bit of quality with every processing step. And then our animators try and add that quality back in at the final stage of motion editing. So we start with our actors on the stage, and in terms of sort of pure body mechanics, this is essentially kind of perfect uh, because we're dealing with a real person and we're dealing with real world physics. And then the system turns that into marker data, and typically we lose kind of a tiny bit of quality here because occluded markers need to be reconstructed. Technically, we're losing kind of a huge amount of information here if we start thinking about kind of muscles and skin and that kind of thing, but in this case, I'm just talking about kind of optical mocap systems and reconstructing those optical markers. Then we typically retarget from those markers to rigid bodies and we lose some more quality uh, there. Then we retarget again from rigid bodies to our game rig and because of proportional differences between our mocap actor on the stage and our game character we can lose a lot of quality here. And then we do our motion editing and the reason that I've put a big question mark here is that the quality that you get here is entirely dependent on the ability of your animation team. Uh, we typically have to kind of constrain the data in lots of different ways to work for our game systems. So often we lose some of the magic of that original data in the process. But on the other hand, this is where we can add stronger posing, we can exaggerate things and we can try and add more appeal. Uh, and so the quality can actually go up here. Um, in a lot of pipelines or with some individual animators, I kind of see this where the animator does this very basic low quality retarget and then immediately bakes the data and starts animating on top of it because they sort of intend to fix all of their retargeting problems with animation. And I'd say that generally this is really bad practice because it's far more time consuming to fix things this way and generally I find that the more that the average animator works on mocap data the worse that it gets and sometimes you have to kind of reset back to the original data and start over again to get kind of a good quality. For me it's really about making the changes that you need to make in the fewest possible moves. With automation we really want things to look more like this. 
I mean, really with any pipeline, you want it to look like this, but it's especially important with automation because it's very difficult to automate exaggeration and appeal. So it's very rare that the quality is going to go up at this editing stage. You know, also every error that gets added through retargeting, if we're automating, we have to write some sort of script to clean that up. And so the fewer errors that we introduce in the first place, the easier our lives are going to be kind of later on. So there's no one trick to getting kind of clean mocap data. It's really just a case of applying a lot of the lessons that we've learned over time and being really anally retentive about quality at each step. So these are all points that I think or would hope that people are already familiar with, so I'm going to skip through this pretty quickly. But I didn't want to talk about motion capture quality without reiterating these points because really these are the most important things. So first we hire professional actors and stunt people for our shoots. This is probably the single most important thing that you can do to get better quality mocap. You should always plan your shoots in advance. Shooting mocap is really expensive, so if you take the time to plan and rehearse, you'll get through a lot more shots on the day. And as part of that rehearsal, at Ubisoft we sometimes hire movement coaches. Uh, so this guy on the right here is, uh, is called Terry Notary. Uh, he's a movement coach that worked uh, with us on Far Cry Primal. And you might be familiar with this guy. He's the movement coach on uh, Planet of the Apes and The Hobbit and Avatar and a bunch of other movies. We capture face, body, and voice at the same time. Again, I think performance capture is something that's pretty well understood by now, at least for cinematics, but we're also trying to do this more and more for gameplay as well. And then finally, like refine your marker setup. Your, your marker setup makes a big difference to the retargeting result, and so it's worth taking some time to try different setups and to make sure that your setup is giving you kind of optimal data. Uh, one thing that we do that I don't think is quite as standard is that we capture finger information at the same time as the body and what we do is an approximation, we're not doing full finger capture. We use two markers, one on the end of the index finger and one for the pinky and uh, you can sort of see that in these top two images. Uh, then we create these three preset hand poses, one where the hand is fully open, one where it's relaxed and then we create a fist pose and then we use those two mocap markers to drive those hand poses. And this actually works pretty well. Um, what you see here in the video is just raw mocap. Uh, so all the finger motion here is what the hand pose system created. It's not perfect, but it's a pretty good base for us to work on. Uh, so this is an interesting one. As I said before, one of the main reasons that problems get introduced with retargeting is that there are proportional differences between the mocap actor and your game characters. So one of the things that we're trying to do more and more of is that we try to build our character proportions to match a kind of average proportion set of our mocap actors. So the way that I do this is to take onset video from a, a range of motion take and then I layer that over the retargeted character. And that makes it really easy to see any problems uh, and then we just sort of iterate on the character proportions with the character team until we get something that we're really happy with. Uh, there's still a few disparities here, but this is a proportion set that we, came, uh, that we came up with on Primal, and we're pretty happy with this, and this has made a huge difference to the kind of quality of our retarget and the quality of the data that we get back from the mocap stage. Um, so with all these mocap tips combined, as I say, the data quality that we get is really high quality, and this immediately reduces a lot of the tasks that a mocap animator, or in our case, an automation system, uh, has to deal with. But once we have this data, we've now got to treat it and that brings us to adjustment blending. So I'm super happy that we finally get to show this off because I've been sitting on this for a while and it's pretty awesome stuff. Um, so let's get to it. What is adjustment blending? So here we've got some raw mocap of this character turning on the spot and this is the typical type of thing that an animator would need to clean up in their day-to-day -day work. And the way we'd do that is that first we'd create a layer and then we'd apply a consistent pose to the start of the clip and to the end of the clip. Uh, but you'll notice, however, that we now have sliding feet. And this is because, as you see here in the curves window, our pose change is being applied across the entire length of this animation. And so to fix this, the animator would have to manually adjust the curves so that our pose change only applies when the foot's moving. And this type of manual adjustment is really painstaking work because it has to be done for each effect that's sliding. And although this is a simple example, in other cases there might be multiple footsteps that need to be compensated for. So now let's look at the adjustment blending tool. And as before, we create a layer and we apply our start pose and our end pose. And as before, we've got sliding feet. 
and then we run the tool and that's it it's done already and you'll see now that our feet are automatically fixed So here's another example. We've got a character running to a stop. Uh, and so first of all, we apply a zero pose to the start of the animation to keep our run pose as it is, and we apply our consistent pose to the end of the animation. But let's say that our game engine wants the stop distance to be a fixed length, say like 3 meters. So we slide our start pose to the correct length and we key it. And as before, you can see we've got a lot of sliding. You'll notice that not only are the feet sliding, but the hips are also sliding at the end where the character would normally kind of settle. So now we run the tool. And there we go. It's fixed all of our sliding problems, and we have a nice grounded stop animation. So what are we actually doing here? Uh, we want to hide any adjustments that we make during the parts where our animation is already moving and we want to make no adjustments where our animation is still so for example when a foot's planted so I'm going to quickly dig into some math here and I know that the talks for the boot camp are animator focused but this is really actually quite simple and I want people to be able to kind of implement this themselves at their own studio so don't worry if you don't follow this kind of perfectly I'm going to post this method online so if you just like follow me on Twitter or something and I'll post a link at some point so as I said before we want to find out where our character is already moving so for each curve on the base layer of our animation we start by looking at the amount of change that's happening from one frame to the next and then we store up those values and we total them up we then convert those per frame values into percentages of the total and once we have that if we then map these percentages to a curve you get something that looks like this so this is our motion delta, and as we wanted, it's showing us where we've got movement and how much movement we have. The peaks here are movement, and the flat parts are areas where this curve is static. Then on our layer, where we applied our new poses, we just apply those same per frame percentage values. And that's it, it's done. We just repeat that same process for every curve. So if we look at a little before and after here, and compare our two layers side by side, here's before, and here's after. So our layer is now only making changes when we already have movement. So just before, after. And one of the really nice things about this method is that since it's just math operations on curves, you can do this in any of the DCCs. And it also means that we can do this at runtime, and I'm going to talk about that a bit more later. There are some issues to be aware of with this method and, and limitations. Uh, first is hyperextension. Uh, any overly large adjustments will lead to hyperextension on limbs, and this is just a kind of reality of real-world body mechanics. There's obviously a limit to how far somebody can stride. Um, so to fix this, we have to detect on which frames we have hyperextension, which is pretty easy to do because we know how long our limbs are supposed to be. And then we find a point between the two ankles, and the position of this point is dependent on how much hyperextension we have on each of the legs. So if we have lots of hyperextension on one leg, then the position of this point is going to be closer towards that leg. And then we move the hips towards that point until we get something that's fixed, like so. That's a very simplified explanation of this, but that's basically how it works. So the second issue to be aware of with adjustment blending is that to get locked contacts, you need to apply this process to your IK effectors. Uh, we're doing this in Motion Builder, which has a full body IK rig, so we don't really have to worry about this too much. Uh, but it might be something that you need to think about if you are if you want to do this in another DCC or at runtime. So the last point to be aware of, adjustment blending is best when it's adjusting motion that already exists on your base layer and not really for adding lots of additional motion into the animation. So for example, say that you've got a character who's standing idle and you want to layer on a motion of that character pushing a button. Since that button press movement on our layer is so much larger than the sort of subtle idle motion on our base layer, it's going to have a really hard time trying to find steep curves in which to kind of hide the button press. And in fact what actually happens is that when it tries to do this, it ends up giving this really kind of terrible, jerky, kind of intermittent motion like this. So this was actually fairly easy for us to fix. One of our steps that I mentioned before was looking at the amount of motion on the base layer and when we do the adjustment blend we basically look at the total amount of motion and we compare it against the amount of motion that we wanted to add 
and if the amount of motion that we're adding is way bigger than the base layer amount we just don't run the adjustment blend on that curve and we stick with the default linear curve and that tends to give us better results. So I mentioned before that we can do this at runtime. Uh, we've got a bunch of programmers looking at this at the moment. It's very early days, but uh, for me this is where it gets kind of really interesting. So I wanted to talk about some of the potential use cases. So say that we've got a character uh, that's running in our game that goes through this sequence of animations. Run, then stop, then idle. Normally this would come with a kind of a bunch of challenges. Uh, first we'd have to make sure that our start and end poses match correctly. We also don't know exactly what poses we're going to be on when the run animation gets the signal to stop. So we'd usually see some blending problems in this area. And then also if it's an AI, uh, we often want our characters to stop an, uh, on an exact point at the end of the path. So we usually have to do some sort of distance and turn correction which causes sliding, which we don't want. So what we do with adjustment blending uh, is at whatever point we interrupt our run, we extract that pose and then we look at the idle pose that we're about to blend into and we extract that pose too and then at runtime we generate an additive layered animation to play over our stop using the adjustment blend algorithm which corrects for the poses what's awesome about this is that since this pose here is extracted we no longer need to have a consistent idle pose that we standardize across all of our base data we can actually have a bunch of different idles and every time that we stop we can randomly select one and we could also randomly pick a start time and the adjustment blend is going to deal with this so here's an example of that all of these guys are actually using the same stop animation it's only the adjustment blend that's pushing them into the different idle poses uh, we could also grab this pose and reposition it in the world before we generate the adjustment blend and this way we can get some degree of distance and rotation correction and again this is the same stop animation we're just moving that end pose and then running the adjustment blend so this got me thinking normally our characters move by sequencing these kind of short clips and we keep these clips short because our systems need to be dynamic but if you've got really good correction then for AI where we've got some idea ahead of time of where the character is going to move you could actually stay in the same motion and then use the adjustment blend to give your system that kind of same dynamism. So what I mean by this is that you could take this whole sequence of animation clips and instead start to use much longer clips of data that do the job of all of those shorter clips and then use the adjustment blend to give your system that dynamism. So here's an example of that. Here we've got a character moving from one piece of cover to another and this is one long piece of mocap so it's kind of like what we'd get from the mocap stage before we do anything to it and we have this really nice movement where he accelerates and he decelerates properly and it all feels like it's kind of in context with his environment but normally what we'd have to do is uh, separate this out into smaller clips so we have a cover exit animation we would go into standard locomotion and then we would have a cover entry animation and we kind of lose something here the standard locomotion maybe doesn't feel quite as appropriate for this context the blends between clips can cause problems you know maybe we have to slide a little bit on the cover entry to kind of correct for the distance here so now say that we go back to our original long mocap clip the one that we like uh, but say that our target cover isn't exactly where we want it to be uh, we could grab that last pose and move it into position then we run the adjustment blend on it and here we go within a certain correction threshold we can kind of correct for this uh, for this end position and this allows our system to work in lots of different situations uh, we could also warp around obstacles to some degree uh, we just take sample poses along the path and then we do multiple adjustment blends like so Uh, you'd have to build a grid of coverage because there's only so much that we can correct so each of these squares represents one animation and you would look for your target cover and then find the closest animation and then correct to where we want it and this might seem like a lot of coverage but this stuff is like super easy to shoot because I don't have to worry about what footsteps uh, the mocap actor is on or any of the usual kind of technical constraints. I just set up the cover objects where I want them and I tell the actor I need you to get from here to here. I don't really care how you do it, you just focus on the performance. You'd still probably need a regular locomotion system to fall back on because you're always going to have interruptions or if you need to do like lots of turns. So if, for example if you've got a, a corridor shooter or something where you, you know, you've got this very dense environment 
maybe this is uh, isn't the best choice for that kind of a game but in a game with relatively open combat spaces i think you'd see kind of a huge quality bump by do it using this kind of system so that's adjustment blending and uh, we used the motion builder version a ton on primal and it really helped to improve productivity for our animators uh, the thing is there's nothing especially clever about adjustment blending the philosophy behind it was really just do what our animators are already doing but write a script to automate it and so we started thinking, what if we took that same philosophy and applied it to the entire motion editing pipeline? So we estimate that adjustment blending saved us about 15% productivity for all of our animators, which might not sound like a lot, but there's a lot of animators at Ubisoft cleaning up a lot of mocap, and so that, that kind of 15% represents a lot of money being saved for the company. So around the time that Primal was hitting Alpha, I went to Yubi's technology group and proposed this mandate of looking at the entire mocap pipeline to try and kind of get a better idea about how inefficient we're being as mocap animators, and then to investigate how we could push that 15% productivity saving higher by automating other tasks. So first I started by doing this analysis of our current mocap pipeline, which was basically me sitting down, recording myself working, and kind of commenting what I was doing as I was doing it. And then I'd go through that recording and note down everything that I was doing, down to individual clicks in some cases, and then I'd note down how much time I was taking to do each action. Uh, so then I took all of those little individual actions and grouped them into these kind of high-level goals, like what was I actually trying to do here? So for example, update all of the rigs in the mocap scene to the latest version of the rig. That would be this kind of high-level goal that I was trying to do, but maybe that takes maybe like 30 clicks to do that. And then I totaled up the time for each of those goals. And then I estimate how difficult that task would be to automate. And this estimation is kind of partly based on my knowledge of Motion Builder and what I know is possible, but it's also based on how much I'm actually thinking about what I'm doing when I'm doing this task uh, versus kind of how much am I just like going through the motions. Um, if I had to make kind of creative decisions, uh, or if I start using animation principles on any one of these tasks, then it's immediately classified as a task that would either be sort of hard or impossible to automate. But sort of as you can see here with all of the green on the right, like you'd be surprised at how many of these tasks are fairly easy to automate and only really require kind of basic information to make decisions. You know, information like what pose am I supposed to be applying here, or like what direction am I supposed to be turning to, that kind of thing. So exactly how inefficient are we? About 54% of the time animators are spending cleaning up mocap is on tasks that we think are easy to automate. Another 25% of animator time is on tasks that are medium difficulty to automate. And only about 20% of animator time is on tasks that would be hard or impossible to automate. So just to drive this home, 50 to 80% of the time that your animators are spending cleaning up mocap is time that a computer could be doing that work. So admittedly, these are very rough numbers, there are a lot of variables at play here, and you know, maybe if you did the same analysis in your own pipeline, you'd probably get something different. But in my experience, what we do with mocap at Ubi is pretty much comparable to what other studios do, and you know, maybe some of you aren't even surprised at this. Like Maybe, uh, maybe in your day-to-day -day work you kind of think of some of the tasks that you do as being the kind of thing that a computer could be doing. But this sort of figure, this 50 to 80 percent, kind of blew my mind, you know, mostly because of how much time I'd spent over my career kind of processing stuff that I probably didn't have to. So with this information, we started to kind of look at actually, like, how do we automate some of this stuff? And this is where we started building the automated tool that I teased at the start. And this is what me and Zach kind of work on now in our day-to-day -day work. We're essentially taking these tasks that an animator would do when, uh, when cleaning up mocap and then writing them as scripts. And then we just have to kind of pick which scripts we want to run and what settings we'd like for each script. I, I kind of see it like building a little kind of animator AI that can kind of help you clean up your data. You know, now with me saying animator AI, this is probably a good time to stress. The goal here is not to replace animators. It'd be super hard to teach a computer how to correctly apply animation principles. The real goal here is to reduce the amount of time that animators have to spend on these sort of boring processing tasks uh, so that we can focus on the creative decisions, which is the fun stuff. Uh, so I don't think anybody should be afraid of automation at all. It's not going to get rid of animators uh, any more than mocap did, really. It's, it's just going to help us do more things and faster. So here's how the automator tool works. Uh, this stuff is kind of difficult to comment on live uh, if you want to keep the exp uh, explanation in sync, so I pre-recorded a video and I'm just going to kind of let it run. 
So, here you can see that we've got a uh, raw mocap take, and uh, this is a character turning on the spot, and we've got all of our different angle coverage uh, in one take. Uh, you can see here that we've got no animation on our displacement object, uh, also the hands aren't correctly gripping the gun, the character doesn't really turn to the exact right angles, and he moves off the spot when he turns, and so on. Uh, these are all things that we'd normally want to clean up, but this time we're going to open our automator tool. So you can see that right here at the top we've uh, got a raw take, and here we have a default clip node that contains all the information about how we want to process this raw data into an animation. Uh, so first I'm going to change the default name to the name that we want for our new animation. So in this case this is turn on spot 45 left. Uh, we want to clamp the hand movement by 50% so that the hands don't fly off the gun. And now we want to pick our frame range for this clip. So first we want to set our start frame and our end frame. Uh, we select the poses that we want to apply. Uh, we prevent translation through the scene. Uh, and we want to flatten keys for 10 frames from the start and end uh, on the displacement object. And for this clip, we want to set our target angle to 45 degrees. Uh, so we check over our settings. And then we want to copy this and move on to our next clip, which should be much faster. So uh, change the name to 45 right, and change the target angle to negative 45. Um, and then we need to set the, the frame range. So first we need to find the start frame, we just scrub through the timeline and set it. And then we need to find the end frame. Just scrub through and set. Uh, but to save time I'm just going to load a completed nodes list. And then we just check through our takes to make sure all of the details are correct. Uh, then I just clicked the Animate button, and I was very adamant when we were building this tool that we had to call this the Animate button. And it's just going through the scripts now, and it's using the uh, annotation information that we've just added uh, to process this data. Um, again, I'm going to speed this up a bit, but just to give you an idea, um, with everything turned on, it's about 7 seconds per clip. So in this case, we've got about 8 clips, so it's just under a minute to process. And there we go. So what we have now is our original raw mocap take at the top, and we now have all of these other animations processed. So uh, here's 180 right, here's 45 left, and it's basically done everything for us. Uh, we're now turning on the spot to the correct angles, uh, we have correct poses applied, uh, the fingers are gripping the gun correctly, and this is free for you to work on top of it, or if you're just happy with this as it is, it could go straight into the game like this. Okay, so this is where we're at right now with automation, uh, but you know, if we keep going down this path, what does the kind of future look like? Okay, I'm just kidding. Uh, really with automation, uh, the sky's the limit. The more that you work on this stuff, uh, the more that you start seeing opportunities to kind of automate more things. Uh, after doing this, it's actually kind of hard for me to go back to regular animation because every time that I do anything, or start, I start kind of thinking about how I could write a script to automate it instead. Uh, for us, our immediate future is kind of supporting as many use cases as possible. Um, I also want to look at kind of automating tasks for motion matching pipelines because Ubisoft is starting to look at that more and more. Um, if you're not familiar with motion matching, you should stick around for the next talk with, uh, with Christian Jean-Juc. Uh, he's going to do a good overview of that. Uh, we're also thinking about how we could automate animation integration into the game engine uh, using the same sort of anima annotation data that I just created using the automator. Uh, finally, I'm also really kind of excited to see how well the adjustment blending works out at runtime, and I kind of really hope that you guys try that out as well at your own studios and, you know, maybe see how you can uh, evolve it yourselves. And uh, that's it. Thank you for taking the time to be here.